Hey friends, it is Jenna What Is Up and welcome back to the War Game Garden and welcome to a preview of this game right here. This is The Presence, which is published by Purple Lantern Games, who is sponsoring today's video. So a huge thank you to them. And it is designed by Sam Gallman. And in The Presence, this is a game for two to five players, plays in about 60 to 90 minutes and it's 12 plus. And you are going to be playing one person as the presence and the rest of the players as the visitors. So you have discovered this mansion in the middle of nowhere and the visitors are drawn to the house and have arrived at the house. The doors have opened and they are in the grand hall. And then one player is playing as the presence. So obviously there is some sort of presence in this old Victorian mansion and the visitors have to try to um, discover the different things, the past about this presence, um, the secrets behind this presence um, with some like deduction, which is very cool, in order to win the game. So uh, I'm going to get into all of the aim of the game, an overview of how it plays as well as all the components in front of me. I will note that all the components in front of me are a prototype. Uh, the box is also a prototype. Um, so everything here is subject to change and they are constantly working on improving the game um, even since I got this prototype. So yes, without further ado, if you guys are interested in seeing all about the presents, if it's something that looks interesting to you, then just keep on watching. Give this video a big thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. And I will have the link to the crowdfunding campaign down in the description box. You guys can go check it out if, like I said, it's something that you're interested in. So. Without further ado, let's get into this preview of The Presence, shall we? All right, so getting into a little bit of an aim of the game as well as a look at all the components in front of me. Again, like I said, this is a prototype, so a lot of this um, will change from now until the final production copy if the campaign does fund. Um, but uh, the aim of the game, like I said, one player will be playing as the presence, and then the other players, so this can play two to five, so uh, the other one player to four players will be playing as the visitors, and each visitor is going to or each person playing as a visitor is going to have a specific character that they are going to play. Um, and basically the visitors are trying to um, do this little bit of like a puzzly deduction um, game in order to find out or reveal these different secrets about this spirit's past. So they are going to have these four different secrets that they are ultimately trying to deduce and reveal in order to win the game. So the visitors will win the game if they manage to reveal all four of these secrets without dying. So the visitors can gain enough fear that they are going to not die, but they are going to cause dread, which ultimately is going to lead to them losing the game. And then as for the presence, this is an interesting role because there's a little bit of acting or like bluffing in this. As the presence, you cannot speak because obviously you are a ghost unless there is a certain card that allows you to, you know, whisper a word, you know, in the shadows, kind of someone hearing something. Um, but as the ghost, as the presence, you cannot speak throughout the game. And the interesting thing is that at the beginning of the game, the presence is actually going to um, choose one of a few different things. So there are these different cards here and these are the two options for um i will add that there is like a scenario book that you're going to get that kind of um brings you into different scenarios and this allows the presence to have some different um cards that they're going to be choosing from they're going to have um like some different um setup and some different rules in the scenarios as well but basically for this scenario zero it's like the easiest scenario with the like uh, prototype that I got, I have two scenarios, and with scenario zero, you are told to take a one and a two and shuffle those up, and then the presence is actually going to randomly choose one of them, which actually these ones are just for the people to kind of see. The visitors can see what the options are that the presence could have gotten. Um, so I actually did shuffle up and randomly choose one here. So I'm actually gonna see now whether the presence is a bad presence 
or a good presence because ultimately if the presence is good they're actually going to be trying to help the visitors um, find out the different secrets from their past in order for everyone to win because if the visitors win the presence wins as well um, and then if the presence is bad Ultimately, the presence is kind of wanting the visitors to think they're good, so they might be playing in a way that is trying to, you know, manipulate them and try to make them think that the presence or they are good, but really they are bad. Because if the presence lets the visitors know that they are bad, um, the visitors can ultimately do things in order to mitigate that. So I did choose one um, with this setup here. So if this was an actual game of the presence, the presence would actually be bad. So this was the bad card out of there is one good and one bad. In some of the scenarios, you might have more cards. Um, and really, the different cards are going to either be bad or good. And then it also will have when revealed kind of rules that also have to be met or things that also have to be met for everyone to win. Um, so with this bad one here, it is a vengeful spirit. Um, and this one says, you win when the black is removed and this card is revealed. And then it says, if revealed, you win immediately. So I will explain the time track and how that works with the timing of the game. So that's kind of an overview of the game, a very brief overview. I will be going into how exactly the game plays and different things like that. Um, this is the type of game that has a lot of like, you know, smaller little things that only come up when you play specific cards. So I'm not gonna go into all of those rules, but I will go into an overview of how exactly the game plays, just so you guys can get a good feel of if it is something for you or not. But getting into the components here, um, like I said, we do have the main board here, the Victorian mansion. I absolutely love the art in this game. It is gorgeous. Um, but you do have the main board here with the main six rooms. I will say that this is the only board that you play with um, in like smaller player counts, but then you do have these added boards here that you guys can't really see but they are some added rooms um, that you add to the house to make it bigger for the larger player counts. Um, so yes, this is the main board. All the players start in the grand hall. This is where they first walked in um, to the front door. You also have this here, which has the cellar, which technically I think this should be at the bottom, but it's fine. Um, you also have a item draw deck and an item discard deck, and you have this great icon um, kind of reference here, which I think is really nice. Um, so that's the main board there. You also have the hope track here, which is going to be the timing of the game. You have the timer here. You have the hope tracker and the dread tracker. So this is going to kind of be how you end the game. If ever the time meets one of the hopes or the dreads, um, the presence card is going to be revealed if they are either good or bad. So if the uh, time marker meets the hope marker, then that means that the good, if the presence was good, they would reveal their card. If the dread meets the time, then if the presence was bad, they would reveal their card as well. So there's different ways for you to manipulate this board. Um, the timer is always going to be going up for each round, but the dread and hope can be moved up and down just like with gameplay and stuff. So that is the hope track. The uh, spirit here or the presence is the veiled in moonlight. She's like a lady in a wedding dress, very creepy. Um, but that is the presence player there. You also have all of the different cards. Like I said, there's going to be different cards um, with the different scenarios. Um, there are these linger dice, which I will add that there are some rules in the rule book that are advanced rules. So there is some like different um, terms like bonding and uh, lingering and manifestation and haunting and stuff like that. Some additional rules um, that can be put into play when you get better at the game and you play it more. Um, so that is what these purple dice are here. We have the chosen presence there. We have some different 
um, clue tokens that are going to be out here. We have like the spirit clues as well as the smaller clues. Um, the spirit is going to have a deck of 12 cards. That is what the uh, presents will have. They will have their hand of cards, which I will explain exactly how those work. Um, and then we have across here all of the four players. So each player will have a player board. So we have the different um, characters. We have the professor, we have the descendant, we have the priest, and we have the detective. Each player is going to have their board. They're going to have a candle which you can light and it can be blown out as well. Lightness and darkness in the game is very important where the spirit or the presence can actually uh, become stronger in darkness. Um, so having light as visitors is kind of working as like protection for you. Um, so it's always nice to have that light. Um, so then also each player does have a marker here that's going to track their fear. And then each player is also going to have a deck of 10 cards and each player is going to be picking up five cards at the beginning of the game and then they're going to be playing down those cards on turns until they have no more cards in their hand and in order to pick back up to your five cards in your hand you do have to take a rest action um, but that is everything for all of the player components each player does get some really great reference cards here it has the uh, round reference it has terms and concepts visitor actions. So it just has everything that you need as a visitor to uh, know what exactly you're doing. Um, this little white pawn here is just the first player marker. You also have some items here that are available. Um, you do have the um, item deck here, but you also do have some out here that you will gain through the smaller clues on the table. And then lastly, we do have this board here, which is very, very important. I believe it is called the secrets board. And there are going to be four different secrets that you are trying to unveil about this presence. You're trying to look into their past and discover these different secrets. Um, so you are doing a little bit of deduction in this game, which I'm a huge fan of deduction. And the deduction is going to be played in an interesting way where basically, each of these secrets is going to have a certain amount of clues connected to it. Um, you have these clue cards and each of the secrets is going to have an icon. And each of the secrets going from uh, your left uh, to right is going to have um, either less or more of their icons in the deck. So the deduction part of this is the more clues that you gain um, as a group, as the visitors you gain, the more information you will gain because if you see that there's less of a certain clue, you might kind of deduce that maybe that's the secret that has less. So this secret here has nine of their icons in the deck. This one has seven, this one has six, and this one has four. This is specifically for a five player game. Um, so you seeing more of an icon might make you deduce that maybe that specific secret is in this leftmost spot. And if you're not seeing very many of a certain clue, it might give you kind of a clue that maybe the secret is the one on the far right. So that is kind of how the deduction game is going to work. You're going to be playing these clues below these secrets in hopes that you're placing them in the correct spot. And then eventually you'll be able to actually flip over these secrets. And then depending on how many uh, clues you have below that that are the correct icon, that then either gets you some sort of reward or if you don't have very many or none at all, it actually gives you some sort of bad thing. Um, so the more of the correct clue that you have below that secret, the better it's going to be. And then eventually, once you do get all four of those revealed, you will win the game as the visitors. Um, so yes, that's a little overview of all of the components I kind of pointed out, but there is a deck of clue cards here as well. Um, and yeah, that is everything for the aim of the game as well as the components. So let's get into quickly a overview of how exactly the presence is played. All right, so getting into exactly how the presence plays, it is played over a various amount of rounds depending on the hope track. So the hope track is ultimately how you determine uh, when the game ends. So you have the timer here that is always going to be going up once each round, but then you also have these hope and dread markers. So 
Throughout the game, these markers are going to be moving down and moving up depending on what the visitors are doing, depending on whether the uh, presence is bad or good. Obviously, if the presence is bad, they might not want to make the dread go down like a lot in the first few turns because that might give the visitors a very big clue that you are bad. So they're going to try to kind of do it a little bit more secretly um, and not as obviously. Um, so yes, each round this is going to be going up. So that's how the hope track works, but each round uh, all visitors are going to get a turn. So it'll go through all the visitors and then the presence will have a turn. You will go into some sort of cleanup phase and then you'll go into the next round. So that's exactly how it works until the time marker does bump in to one of these two tokens. And then the game will end either in good or bad ways um, so yes that's how that works but moving into the visitors turns so each visitor will have a turn and on their turn they are going to be picking up five cards like I said once those visitors are finished or all out of cards in their hand they will have to take a rest action in order to pick up five more but they will have cards in their hand and these are going to be cards that they can play down on their turn. And on a visitor's turn, they have three actions. So the actions are going to be on these little reference cards. So you can trade. So you can trade with another person that is in the same room as you. Um, you can also play a card, which I'll get into. You can use a room's action. So there are going to be some rooms that are going to have some sort of action that you can use. So for example, here, there's the dining hall and the dining hall actually has a fireplace. And if the fireplace is lit, you can take that action in that room. And that is that if the fireplace is lit, light your candle and remove any active fear cards. So that's a great way to get rid of your fear cards. You can also do the action of walking. So that's simply just walking uh, one space from one room to the other. Then you can also rest, like I said. So those are all of the different actions that you can perform. The different cards that you have in your hand are going to allow you to do some different actions. So uh, I believe each person has the exact same hand of cards. There's going to be some search cards. There's going to be some investigate cards. There's also going to be contact, invoke. Let me get all of the other cards so I can explain exactly what they do. Um, so the first type of card is the search card. So this is going to allow you to draw two cards from the item deck. You get to choose one item card to keep. The item cards are going to be placed beside your board. You're going to choose one to keep, place it beside your board, and then the other one is going to get discarded into the seller which the seller's action here is that you can actually look at all the cards that were discarded to the seller and you can uh, choose one of them. So that's a nice one to have. I will add that there is also a little bit of a hindrance to these cards if you're in the dark. So if you do not have your candle lit, you have to instead draw one. So um, all of these cards, I believe, have some sort of negative thing that happens if you don't have um, your candle lit or you're not in a room that is illuminated if you're in darkness. Um, so the search action, and then also there is a secondary action on a lot of these cards as well. So this one here has a secondary action, so you can use it for one or the other. You could either search with this card or you could walk, so that means that you could move twice and then spend to move um, and open doors. So you could use, you know, one to move and then one to open a door. You also have haste, which is moving three, and then you may not open doors during this movement. So you're like running through the house. You also have the investigate action, which is that you are going to be revealing one of the nearby clues. So you have to be in a room with a clue and you're going to reveal that clue um, and a lot of the smaller clues are going to allow you to gain something. So this one here allows me to gain one clue card. I would add that to my hand um, and then I would discard that clue. Um, there's also the presence clues, which are not the best. This one here is darkness. Spirit smothers a nearby candle. So unfortunately your candle would go out or if you were in the same room with someone else, you could decide to smother their candle, um, but you would also be able to pick up a uh, clue card as well. So that's always good. The clue cards are very, very important, obviously, because that's going to allow you to end up winning the game. Um, so that is the investigate card. You're going to reveal one nearby clue and then uh, resolve the effects. So that is that. We also have contact, 
which this requires a nearby spirit die. So the spirit has to be in the room with you. The spirit is represented by these dice here, which I will get into. Um, but wherever there is a die, that means that the presence is there. The presence has presence in that room. Um, so it has to have a nearby die and the spirit may reduce it by one to say a word or add a nearby clue. So if the spirit was good, they might want to reduce their die by one in order to kind of whisper something that might help you. Um, they might, if they're bad, still want to do that to kind of trick you into thinking that. Um, they can say anything they want. So they could say like, good lying to say that they're good, but they're actually not. Um, but also they can add a, another clue. So that's a good way for them to get some clues out on the board. You also have invoke, which is a very interesting one. So this is choose a discarded clue with the title of your room. So each of the clues is going to have a certain room at the top. So the one that I took here was parlor. So when it says discarded, whenever you discard a clue, you are actually discarding it below the secrets board. So with invoke, you're actually choosing one of the clues below the board that is in the same room as you. So for example, if this one was below the board, if I was in the parlor, I could point at this clue card here. I could say I'm in the parlor and I could flip over this clue here. Now, depending on how many of the correct icons I had below that, that would determine if we got some sort of reward or if we got some sort of bad thing. Um, the more clues that are correct, the more uh, like good will happen. Um, also, when you do flip over that secret, there's going to be some sort of thing that happens on the card as well. Um, so that's invoke. That's a good way to flip over those secret cards. And then you also have comfort, which is that a nearby visitor cures one fear and trashes their fear card. So that's if somebody around you, um, you are not considered nearby for yourself. It's only the people around you. So that's a good way to help your fellow visitors. Lastly is illuminate, which is light a nearby candle or move a nearby uh, dice off of a uh, spirit clue, which this is actually connected to, I believe, the haunting or the manifesting. So that might be some sort of advanced rule there. So really this one is just for illuminating if you're not playing with the advanced rules. Um, but also there is a free action down here. I will add that these are free actions. So the illuminate is a free action, so it doesn't count towards your uh, three actions. And then also there's an additional one at the bottom here that is follow. So this can actually be played on another person's turn. And it says play directly after a visitor moves nearby, move to them if able. So there are going to be some different actions here that you can kind of decide between. There's always going to be two different things that you can decide. Um, some of them are going to be quick actions. Some of them are going to be main actions. Um, but that is generally how the visitors are going to play. They're going to be playing three actions on their turn, moving around the house, kind of getting these different clue cards, revealing these different clues, trying to deduce what the secrets are um, in order to ultimately win the game. Um, so that is how the visitors kind of work. And then moving on to the spirit. The spirit is very cool where, like I said, you have these different dice in different rooms and that represents uh, the presence that the presence has in those rooms. So right now the presence is in all of these rooms um, and they are going to be able to do their specific actions based off of the presence that they have. So there's going to be actions on their cards that they specifically have to have a certain amount on these um, dice numbers in order to perform that action. So they're gonna have to try to get their pips up in order to do stronger actions. Um, some of the actions are going to make them spend those pips in order to perform those actions. Um, so I will kind of give you guys a general example of exactly how these cards uh, work. So this card here has two different things that the uh, spirit can choose from or presence can choose from. So we have a nearby visitor with a lit candle must smother it or suffer fear. Add a clue nearby if it is dark. So this, uh, in order to perform that action, the spirit would have a one or higher and have to spend one. So if they only had a one in the room, they would actually have to spend the one. That would make it go to a zero. And then they would actually have to discard this off the table or off of the board. So they would no longer have their presence. So 
the stronger the presence, the more that they can do. Um, but ultimately, if they do kind of push themselves too much, they're going to run out of that presence, um, run out of that energy that they have in order to do these things. Um, and those dice will go off the board. There are going to be different actions that are going to allow them to place them back on the board. But ultimately, they are trying to, if they are bad, they are trying to um, kind of hold off and put the dread down in different ways in order to uh, reveal their card and then win the game. Because like I said, if the dread ever hits the timer or if the timer ever hits the dread, um, the bad presence would reveal their card. And then most of the time that means that the presence would win. And then also I will say if the presence is good and the uh, timer does hit the hope marker, the card is revealed. Unfortunately, even good ghosts, like they only have so much time and they only have so much like patience, I guess. Um, but basically if the timer does hit the hope track, a good presence will still have to reveal their card. And unfortunately that's going to add um, some sort of other thing that has to happen in order for all of the visitors and the presence to win. So in this example, if the time tracker hit the dread or the uh, hope marker, then this would be revealed. And it says all players lose when this round ends. So if they are not able to get all of these, uh, flipped over by the end of this round, then unfortunately they would lose. So you're really trying to, you know, do as much as possible on your turns. This is really an efficiency puzzle. Really paying attention to how much time you have left, where that hope and dread marker is, is really important when it comes to uh, ultimately winning the game, whether the presence is bad or good. So. Yes, I believe that is going to be everything for this overview. Like I said, I didn't want to get into the nitty gritty of every single card and exactly how every little thing plays, but I gave you a good overview of how exactly the presence plays. So hopefully that gives you a good feel of if it is something for you or not. Um, but yeah, that is everything for the overview of the presence. All right, friends. So that's going to be everything for today's preview of the presence. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, please give this video a big thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Huge thank you to Purple Lantern Games again for sponsoring today's video. Um, if you guys are interested in checking out the presents, I will have the link to the crowdfunding campaign down below for you to go and check out. Um, but yeah, that's everything for today. I love you guys so, so much. Remember, you are somebody's reason to smile, and I will see you in the next board game video. Bye, friends. <laughs>